is uh, who is Isis? Who is when we talk about Hathor, when we talk about Mother Mary, when we talk about Baset, when we talk about Sekhmet, when we talk about these divine energies, we're also going to be getting to look even further back. And we're going to see that this is a very divine, sacred energy that goes back to Barbello, that goes back to Pistis, that goes back to Suhia, that goes back to Sophia. So I'm going to share a few different perspectives in this, but truly our invitation is, is really to get to see our emanation within the physical reality. How do we get to play our role within physical form as still an emanation of the solar emanation, the solar raw family, the solar light? that which is the giver of life, that which is the life source of the great central sun that allows us to live, to breathe, to express ourselves, and to hold our containments of our ka, our ba, <laughs> our soul, <laughs> and our physicality. And that within that, we get the mer, the mer, the mer ka ba, which would becomes now the vehicle of this moving of the energy of our physical body, our soul body, all as an emanation of one. So we're going to look at what is the eye of Ra and the divine feminine role of the light. So this is a, an incredible image as we get to see there's going to be a lot of symbology within here. And this is such an extensive thing that truly we're really going to be doing some energy work today with Sekhmet. So this isn't going to be a full history of the Eye of Ra. In fact, we're just going to lightly start to touch into some of it. That within this, this is actually holding two different emanations of representations of what we might think of as Hathor, Sekhmet, Baset, Isis, Se'et, Aset, and also I'm going to have to read these in here just to say them, but these, these beings in the picture are Nekbet and also Wadjet, which is the cobra. Wadjet is depicted by the cobra. Nekbet is depicted by the vulture. And so as we're going to see this, this is already symbolizing within the eye of Ra, it's holding two different personages within the divine mother goddess energy. And this divine mother goddess energy truly is within the serpent is the divine Kundalini, the divine serpent, the divine red regeneration and all that we've um, uh, we've talked quite a bit about within the serpent. So I'm not going to go a whole lot into the energy of the serpent, but just understand that within this vibration of an aspect of the divine mother all of these names are different aspects of the same being and i want to add in there mother mary and i want to take it now backwards into barbello to pistis to suhia to sophia we're going and I'm going to read a little bit as we get to see this and that it actually goes all the way back into a term that we're going to have a different perspective, even from Anton Park's works today, of that it's the primordial mother matrix. And we're going to get to see a different perspective and a different way of looking at when we talk about how Sophia dreams the dream that we are in, that she is using her intentions to hold a dream for us to exist within. And this is primarily in order for us to rehabilitate and restore and correct a few things that went out of alignment, a few things that went a little overly chaotic within creation, but that the true gift that we have is to actually emanate and project ourselves into different forms in order to continuously insert ourselves into the dream, in order for us to wake up in the dream and co-create the dream with the mother goddess. So the reason why I really like to show all of the different ways in which divine Sophia has inserted herself into the dream, 
we're going to get to see that when she inserts herself, she inserts herself as a very powerful emanation that holds a great vibration for us to anchor into, right? But that all of these are, it's very well known that all of these are emanations that she has stepped into in order for her to actually physicalize herself into the dream. And we, in many ways, are the children. We, in many ways, or the aspects of her dreaming the dream, but that it is our responsibility to remember our place within the dream so that we can co-create it together. So now let's let's come back to the Eye of Ra. So within Egyptian mythology, the Eye of Ra is a goddess. It always is a goddess. The Eye of Ra is always held by a divine feminine figure who is associated with the sun and is often depicted as a lioness. Most depictions of the holder or the, the Eye of Ra is a title. It is a title. It is a title like queen. It is a title holder. And so the Eye of Ra has been held by different personages, but each of these personages we're actually going to see are just different names of emanations of the same being. Hawthor, easy for us to actually see that Hawthor transfigured and and transformed into Sekhmet. Sekhmet also transformed into Baset. So these are all transformations within them. Some of them are literal step out, step in, and transform into another form. And sometimes it's actual just a new parthenogenesis and a new triple birth or a new birthing into creation in order to be now part of the dream, enter and be physically born into the dream. That's what we all are right now. We are all physically born into the dream. So there's are not multiple females who hold the title of ah, Eye of Ra. Rather, the Eye of Ra is a single divine entity that takes on different forms and functions in various myths and legends. In some stories, the Eye of Ra is a protective force that wards off evil and defends the Pharaoh. While in others, she is a fierce warrior who battles the enemy of the gods. So there is the yin and the yang within the eye of Ra energy. And even within the eye of Ra, we know that it is the right eye and the left eye is the eye of Horus. So that we also still have within it that they are both two symbologies that just hold different polarities. Again, the eye of Ra is connected to the solar disk, the solar deity. And it is the emanation and it is the symbol of power. It is the power of Ra, that without the eye of Ra, Ra becomes weak upon the earth. Just let that soak in for a moment, because as we understand or understand Ra, the, the, the Ra confederacy, the, the, the Ra family, and I'm just going to kind of stop, stop, laterally um, sidestep over here with within this information of the family of Ra. And within this, let me see if I actually have it up. I actually have it up on this one. Um, within this, the family of Ra is a gestalt from, from beyond this 15 dimensional time matrix. They are a family that answered the call within this 15 dimensional time matrix to be of assistance. They work with the family of Michael. They work with the different um, the Christos um, councils and gestalts within this realm who have been holding the Emerald Law. They were actually one of the families that really assisted within it. Now, the, the, the Ra Confederacy or the family of Ra actually split into multiple different family lines in order to truly being of assistance in multiple different levels. And part of this kind of lineage line and one of the strands that was created through this family line is something that we know of as the blue, um, the blue ray Melchizedek's are in unison with this and work in harmony with this as the archivists, the librarians and the record keepers within the inner earth of earth. So when we even think of the Melchizedek family, um, there is a great connection to their energy for those that still hold the blue flame, 
within them because within the blue flame these are the beings in such a powerful way that were not distorted their template was not distorted and they are a divine and beautiful family line that has been really holding the records in the inner earth so for those of you that are connected to the inner earth families this is going to be that deep connection in so many ways to telos to agartha to these inner earth civilizations that hold such a vibration of holding the the chambers within there the initiation chambers the blue flame initiations and this would have also been the halls of amenti um now the halls of amenti are actually hidden within a, di a dimensional plane within the inner earth so they're not something that is actually accessible unless you have the initiation or you are guided or led to them within this uh, way. Now, within this, the Ra family is very much connected to the higher councils within Orion. Now, within Orion, we know this as, as one of the, the, the eight stargate, the higher heart portal. We've also talked about this quite a bit, so I don't want to go too much time into that. But just to have an understanding that the Ra family has a, a huge connection to that higher Orion council within there that oversees the Syrian council and works in alignment with the Aurora Earth templates. So the Aquafarian family lineage lines. That within this, if we think of the family of Ra, that one thing I want to just kind of say in there is that they're really a Rishik level of consciousness. And that is like they are, it is as if they are like the light of a thousand suns, a consciousness that is like such a luminescence of, say, thousands of suns, that it would be an emanation that we would think of as a God source. This is really, truly where when we get a lot of the um, messages um, through through the children of Mu, the Mu, the motherland, the honor of the sun, the land of the sun, the children of the sun, the honoring of Ra, the honoring of the the land of Mu, and all of these uh, teachings that emanated out of the motherland of Mu prior to Lemuria, right here on Earth. The motherland of Mu teachings, which were based on the cosmic teachings of the cosmic ray and the living light of the sun or the living ray of one. And this is truly a beautiful way for us to really have a level of understanding to this consciousness that has emanated it out, itself out in multiple different family lines. And they are primarily emanated out through what we might think of as different dragon lineage lines there's the cantarian dragons that hold a ray, a ray and a lineage line through here there's the golden dragons that hold the lineage line there's the kumara dragons which are connected with the golden dragon lineage lines there's the blue dragon lineage line there's all of these different rays and the violet and uh, also <laughs> lineage lines of these dragons and so as we think about these different rays each of them we might have a different connection in how we are being in service to anchoring in the light upon the earth but that is we do this that the way that we do it is by again awakening the seed within us so that we become the luminescent we become the the radiance and the message now, I don't have it right in front of me, um, but if you feel guided, I do have it on the members section is the books by James Churchward, I believe is the correct way to say his last name. And it's about uh, there. I think there's a couple on there. Um, um, the Children of Mu. Um, and I forget the names of the other one right there, but there are there are the books that he wrote about the motherland. Um, so the energy some one of them might be the symbology of Mu. But if you get a chance to connect with those, you're actually going to see, again, that it was the divine feminine, the divine goddess, the divine serpent, the divine nagas even, that held the ray within them that were the now the emissaries of the symbols of Ra in order to translate them to humanity, to the earth plane, and to the people. 
So again, it is this divine goddess energy that is the one that can hold the vibration of Ra. Think again, the Parthenogenesis women, what do they do? They're able to transcend into the higher dimensional planes in order to, to connect to the cosmic life forces, to seed the pure life right within them and to birth deities to birth <laughs> these divine beings into creation here so within this this is this is kind of beyond it when we think of again isis hathor bastet sekhmet um these divine beings but i want to give a lot of different perspectives as you connect to whomever you connect to that truly what they're doing is they are, have the direct connection to the Rishik sons. And from this di direct connection to the raw family lineage line, that they have the ability to now actually hold the power of it within them and be the all seeing eye here upon the earth. So the eye of Ra, so giving the solar sun, giving the solar Rishi the ability to actually see what's going on here in the earth plane, but also being the transducers of that energy to the earth plane in order to allow that energy to now emanate the power upon the earth in order for the earth to now be seeded with the light. So now as you get to kind of hold this, in Egyptian mythology, the Eye of Ra is believed to have taken on many different forms. Here are some different ones. There's the goddess Hathor. Each of these have been depicted as the Eye of Ra. There is Hathor. There is the lioness goddess Sekhmet. There is the cobra goddess Wajet. There is the cat goddess Bastet. There is also um, Tefnut, who is associated with moisture and the rain. And she's also many times depicted as a lioness or a woman with the head of a lion. Then there's the goddess Nekbet, which is the vulture. There's also the goddess Mut, which is often also depicted as an avian being. So many times she will either have wings or she will also have a, a, a beak or um, either like a vulture or a falcon uh, type of feature to her. Each of these are all different beings that are representing different aspects of the goddess. The aspects of the goddess hold the vibrations of mothering, nurturing, protecting, power, the ability to heal, the ability to destroy. Kundalini energy. This is going to be the energy of fertility. This is going to be the energy that is many times connected to blood, the menstrual cycles, um, the blood of life, which is the star fire, so the color red. Black, which symbolizes death and fertility. So the black color in many ways is twofold, but really think about the energy of fertility, which is motherhood, childhood, birth, creative energy. So fertility and also death, which truly could also be symbolized with fertilizer, and notice the infinite cycle between fertility and fertilizer, <laughs> the death, the birth and death cycle and the rebirth cycle that actually happens. So she truly is both because when we truly look at death from the higher perspective, death is very much alive. It isn't something that is stagnant. It is something in which life is always perpetuating itself again. So here are some, again, of the different forms of the same being of the Eye of Ra. So we get to see Bastet here in the center, Hathor, Wajet, and then I apologize, I keep forgetting how does Nekbet, yes, the vulture, um being so these are just some different representations that we get to see and then with each of them they are all holding to some degree either the solar disc within them the cobra so the serpent and even within uh the 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 vulture in here it's the solar with the serpent encircling it around and we also know that the serpent many times is depicted with wings because there is a interconnection between 
the serpent and the avian as they are in many ways the same being just split one is of the earth and one is of the sky so that is another way of looking at it but now let's really step into the energy of Sekhmet she's been really coming forward for us to have an ability to connect with her that when we connect with her she is she is known as she with a thousand names she with so many epithets that you could go on and on and on reading all of the different ways in which she has been honored and represented. She is seen as the one who was before the gods were, the lady of the place of the beginning of time, the one of great healing. Her most... Um, Familiar and repeated myths, however, interpretations often um, contradictory myths. All myths have a little bit of a contradictory energy. And in which um, she was most significantly coming through as a manifestation as the Eye of Ra and embodying the seemingly contradictory but actually complementary aspects of danger and destruction, as well as protection and healing. So she's known really as the mistress of life. She's associated with both the Eye of Ra and the Eye of Horus. Now, as we get to see this, we're just kind of kind of skip ahead a little bit within there. She's associated and the Eye is associated with numerous deities such as Sekhmet, Hathor, Tefnut, Mut, Maet, which I didn't put in there, but she is such a powerful being to connect with. Bastet, Wad Jet, again, the Cobra being. In fact, one of Sekhmet's many names was the sun goddess of the Ennead. She was also referred to as the Eye of Horus when she was linked with healing, just as the Eye of Horus was healed. And so therefore, we can begin to see that there is an absolute mix of energy within here as we get to connect to it. And that it's um, one of her greatest myths really comes from something called the Book of the Heavenly Cow. So this is Hathor. The Book of the Heavenly Cow was referring to Hathor and is one of the first compositions recorded um, where this myth came forward of Ra calling forth Hathor to assist because humanity or the earth realm was really in a state of chaos. And so therefore the energy was such that when she came, there was such turmoil here that it created a rage that wanted to ex just eradicate <laughs> humanity upon the earth. But that within that, that Ra had compassion for creation upon the earth, for humanity upon the earth, and didn't want to kill off all of humanity. And so it was when this Hathor went through this rage that it was actually the emanation of the Sekhmet that came forth. So even if you get to read that, that mythology and that story, you will see there's, there's basically a phrase within there. It was when Hathor then became Sekhmet. So this is how we get to see how we're tying in characters and different representations and different epithets, if you will, of the very same same goddess or same energy or being now within this there is there is a part of the story of which it is said that Ra didn't want her didn't want Sekhmet to come and just destroy all of humanity and so when she was going to return there was this idea of creating all of this mead something to intoxicate her right now I'm going to kind of expand on this because this is something that's been been kind of talked about within within the I, idea and the mythology of Sekhmet. That Sekhmet was the eye seeing the all seeing eye. There wasn't really a way that she was going to come into Earth and be tricked and deceived that a bunch of red colored beer on the ground was blood and that that was going to be her revenge of lapping up the blood of humanity. There was nothing, there was, this was just something that was kind of put within the mythology. But if we kind of start to look at it from a higher perspective, we're going to see this as an initiation that many of the Parthenogenesis or the triple goddesses went through when they would connect to the higher realms. 
that many times there was the use of uh, uh, mind altering tinctures, plants, teas, drink, that would then awaken one to the higher levels of consciousness or to the liminal states or the shamanic realms. And that it was truly within this that we actually get to see that when Bastet, or sorry, when Sekhmet returned, that yes, she went through the initiation of awakening herself to an other level of consciousness. And that actually from that, she exuded compassion. She exuded love. She exuded acceptance within there. And so I do not <laughs> go with the, the idea that, oh, well, she, she felt as though, yes, I drink a bunch of blood. So yeah, humanity is dead. I got it. No way. She's the eye of Ra. She's the all-seeing eye. She is the all-knowing one. Therefore, this is really a depiction of her yet transforming yet into another energy that we get to really see that she, yes, she does have the persona of destroyer, but she is also holding the persona of healer within there. And as I invite you into this energy, that this is something that we could start to embrace within us as we maybe potentially feel guided to connect. If you feel personally guided to connect with Sekhmet, with Hathor, with Isis, with Basset, with Wajet, <laughs> with any of these divine emanations or representations of the goddess, that within Sekhmet specifically, she's going to offer us the ability to go within ourselves to be the destroyer. What are we destroying? What was she so upset about in that story? She was upset about the disrespect that humanity was exuding towards the divine light. Ra. Ra, again, the solar Rishi energy, this divine giver of life energy, right? The living life force energy. She saw the disrespect that humanity was exuding towards the energy of Ra, and therefore it enraged her and she destroyed. If I was to take this into myself as a personal meditation, this is going in and finding anything within me that is disrespecting the divine living light, anything parasitic, Anything that is dead light energy, anything that is not exonerating living light energy within me, that we can call upon the energy of Sekhmet within us to destroy any parasitic energy within us that is not upholding living light law of one trinity wave energy within us. And that within this, we can go through that transmutation process of e expanding our consciousness through, through maybe this, this, this level of meditation or expanding our consciousness in any way. And as we expand, then it is the potential then to again, step back into our loving consciousness of why did we choose to incarnate into a material form? So that we could be the eye of Ra, so that we could be the emissaries of this energy, right? So that we could be the ones that share the seed of light, so that we could have compassion, so that we could continuously nurture that which source creator loves. That there is a love for the different forms of creation, so within this, again, as we get to look at this, that there could be three representations as we look at the energy of Sekhmet. That um, within uh, the Feast of Light, Norman D. Ellis uh, has the aspect in there that we might be able to look at. And that is, is that Sekhmet could be the crone, Bast, the mother, and Hathor, the maiden. You can really kind of mix those any way you choose or you feel more uh, and I don't have all the reasons why they chose that but I just wanted to grab that within there but a lot of times we see this aspect of the triple goddess or the triple form or the spinners of fate and 
when we look at Hathor and we look at um, these different emanations, that many times there is a tie-in with the thread or the spindle. And this ties into the idea of the weavers of fate and the fates and our fate as a soul as we live within the laws of the universe, the laws of cause and effect, that we might think things are happen chance, or we might think things are, oh my gosh, it's destiny or this or that, but truly the weavers of the webs or those that are connected to the web of the quantum field of creation would actually be able to see all of the different cause and effect and the different laws of the universe that have been put into ripple effect throughout your soul's incarnational journeys. And therefore, it wouldn't be a mystery <laughs> what you might have as experiential experiences within this lifetime. And so therefore, the more that we get to start to connect to that, that, that web or that thread, we get to now start to really realize, well, if there are things within the dream that we don't enjoy, it's not about us being set in fate. It's about us becoming master dreamers again and redreaming the web of the dream in which we are existing in. So this is again where we can pull in the vibration and the energy of this divine eye of Ra, that within this divine eye of Ra, that this is our invitation to take our ability to connect to the dream. And now I want to read something, and this is actually from Anton Park's books. I've I've taken a couple um, clips within there. And I don't have them on the screen, so I'm just going to read them to you. And what I want to kind of touch into is this idea of Barbello. So as you see these different beings, I'm just going to invite you to look into to their eyes. These are different images we have on the left is going to be Sekhmet with the sun disk. In the middle is Hathor. And on the right with the blue eyes is Bastet. Each of these being different emanations of the divine sky goddess. That within there, we have other emanations that you can tie into, which is Mother Mary, which is Arishkigal, the queen of the underworld, which is Isis, the queen of the heavens. <laughs> She held both roles, right? These are going to be beings that are connected to Venus and the Venusians. These are going to be beings that are connected to Ra. These are all beings that hold the title, the Eye of Ra. And as we get to connect to these beings, I want to just go back a little bit more in history. And as we connect to the idea of Barbello, so, so we talk about Isis. Who is Isis? Isis is Se'et or Aset, who would have been a, a, a divine priestess. She was a divine priestess uh, that would have been called within, within, uh, within the Anton Parks books and within the Sumerian texts, this would be something called an Amasudam. Now, an Amasudam is a priestess. It is a, a divine um, triple Parthenicus birthed female being that would have been a priestess. This would be when we think of the beings in the Pleiades, when we think of the seven sisters. And just to just to give you another, another perception, one of the titles of Hawthors is called the seven Hawthors. And the seven Hawthors actually correspond to the seven sisters or the seven stars within the Pleiades. Okay, so this is where we start to really get to see exponentially how we're connected to all of these different mythologies. And if you are connected to these Lemurian mythologies, this is also going to connect in with the Nagas, the divine serpentine goddesses. This is going to connect to the motherland of Mu, the keepers of the sun disk. Gosh, I wish I had this other uh, thing. Let me, um, I want to read this, a couple of different things for you. So I'm going to 
just kind of read something right here. That there is a cosmology within the motherland of Mu. And within the motherland of Mu, let's see if I can just show the symbol. I don't know if it will actually show up for you guys or not. And this, I could show it, it's called the cosmology symbol of Mu. And I don't know if it's on there or not, but I'm just going to show it this way. And the cosmology symbol of Mu, which I will share on the telegram just so that it's there, um, is the, it is one of the primary symbols that symbolized all of creation. So this is really going to tie into the ideology even of the Ira, the keeper of the sun disk, or the one that holds the solar disk or the wisdom of the sun. That in Moon's cosmogonic, uh, cosmogonic sorry, diagram, it is a circle within two crossed and interwoven triangles. Being interwoven or interlaced, these triangles form but one figure. That within this, these 12 divisions really truly hold the symbology of the gates to heaven where dwells the heavenly father. These gates symbolize the virtues, the 12 great earthly virtues by which man must possess before he can enter the gates to be among the beings of the higher heavens. And in order to do this, one must actually hold the 12 great earthly virtues of some which are the, the primary foundational virtue is love. Bottom line is love. But amongst them, aside from love, is also energies like hope, charity, chastity, faith. That the space between the second and third circles is the world beyond, which the soul must pass through to reach the gates of heaven. This could be talked about many times when we talk about the soul transcending the body, how it must travel beyond the bardos. It has to travel to the worlds beyond, and it must travel here to reach the gates of heaven. And that when it gets to these gates of heaven, that these great earthly temptations that we have had to deal with upon the earth would have had to have been overcome by the material body before the soul could pass through the gates to move to the world beyond. So I want to just really amplify again when we really get into the mystery teachings, the ancient teachings of, say, the Isis mystery schools, the Magdalene mysteries, um, the 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 mysteries of the rose, so the sacred rose mystery um, schools and so on, that as we tap into these mystery teachings, all of these teachings on some foundational level were about how to transcend the lower vibratory frequencies within the body. So the lower desires of the body in order to learn how to move our consciousness in and out of form, right? And as we move our consciousness in and out of our physical reality, that there is something within the journey of the soul as it moves through the stargates, that there is a place that after it passes through Orion, and it is to actually pass to where it meets the great avian energy, there is a keeper at the gate, the keeper at the threshold there. That the nickname for many of the Native American tribes and many of the different indigenous cultures upon the earth, the nickname of that gatekeeper is called the skull crusher. And what it refers to is that when we reach that gate, that our skull must be cracked open, which means we have to fully free ourselves from any bindings to our um, level in the body or the material reality in order for the soul to be able to pass through the gate to move to the world beyond. That the ribbon with the eight divisions, even within the symbology, shows the eight roads to heaven that shows how a man can ascend or how a person can ascend the gates to the world beyond. That these intricacies, so this is within the motherland of Mu, this is what it says here, the intricacies of what Isis was beyond symbolizing nature and being the excretes of God's commands, 
was only understood by the Egyptians themselves as they were not all in accord on the subject. In ceremonies and processions, Isis wore as her headdress a moon with a pair of cow's horns. The cow's horn symbolized the motherhood and the goddess Sati of the upper Egypt and the goddess Hathor both had cow horns also. So this is showing Hathor and Isis also this, this connection within there. Um, I didn't, I didn't make, uh, cuts within this. So I'm just reading, this is all coming from the, the, the book from James, um, church ward of the children of Mu. And so within this, it was showing that within this, the, the, the primary holder of this wisdom of the vibration of how to move through the solar disc and for how the soul to actually move through the gates and to actually enter into the land of Ra or the higher heavens, that one had to learn to hold the higher virtues. And within holding the higher virtues, that one would transcend through one of these eight gates and then be able to go through the initiation where one would then be able to then fully and completely enter into the inner circle or into the inner disc or back into the light of the sun. And so as we hold this, this is truly in some ways a, a summary of what a lot of the work is that we're doing. But as we get to look at this, why so difficult moving through these gates? What are these gates really about? What is it containing in? What is it keeping in or holding out, right? What is the, the containment or this holdingness of these gates? So now as we think of Isis, Isis again is, is also a set or set at, C-E-E-T, um, and you can again see this uh, if you read some of Anton Park's books, and you're going to see that Aset or Set was one of the uh, sacred Amasudam that was born to the to Namu. And Namu we might even see within Egyptian mythology as Nut, N-U-T. So the goddess Nut, the holder of the sky or the being of the cosmology of the Milky Way galaxy, this the river of stars. Um, I also feel she's very much connected to uh, Hecate, to Nyx, to, to these primordial deities and beings, right? So as we get to look at um, Namu or Mamu, which is the mother, she is considered the mother. She was the, the, the mother of uh Anki, she was the mother of Isis. She has the mother genes. And again, this isn't like she just birthed. This is part of the genetic lineage line. So now Barbello was someone that she was directly in service to. So, so Namu, Mamitu, Mamu was directly in service to Barbello. Who is Barbello? Barbello is a reincarnation or a, an other incarnate expression of Pistis or of Suhia or of Sophia, Sophia. When we talk about the divine Sophia, the divine Aeon Sophia, we can now start to get a little bit of that lineage and it's it's still quite massive to get to understand it. But what I wanna show within here is Barbello in her expression of Barbello, Barbello was born into Mardiga or what we would call Ursa Major or Dube in the Dube area. And within this, she was actually living a life very much like one of these divine priestess beings as an astrophysicist and an archivist. She worked within the libraries there. And part of her incarnation in that lifetime was to start to re reassemble the archives, the libraries, the ancient records that have been lost since prior to the Lyran days. And as she was reinstating a lot of these records, we get to look at Barbello now as also following in the same footstep as Pistis. So if we go backwards in time and, and from her, from Barbello's perspective, Pistis would have been some mythology from long before her. 
And as we get to go back now in time, and who's Pistis? Pistis was one of the queens. She was the one of the queens of the Ursa system, the Ursa Major. So as we look at this, she was one of the divine queens. And within this, as she was exploring, she was also very much like an astrophysicist as well, and went off on a journey, but got lost through some time portals and some fabrics in time. This is going to start to kind of show us these fabrics in time, these worlds, these dream bubbles, and these dimensions that we kind of get pulled into. And she got lost within this realm, but before she left, she cloned herself. She did the parthenogenesis. She birthed from herself a whole field of matriarchs, which were called the dark mothers. And these dark mothers were exactly like her and she birthed them in order to be put in charge of the kingdom while she was away now who is pistis pistis is actually a reincarnation again <laughs> of sophia who was at another time even prior earlier sophia who did the same thing she was the birther of another group called the Argons of the Shadow. These were the divine matriarchs. These were the divine goddesses. These were some of the divine original. These would be cosmic beings <laughs> that were also these, these incredible beings who were in high vibrational consciousness of exploring and expanding through the universe. Now, there's a whole lot more that was kind of going on in there. But what I want to start to show is that she was all about discovering what was going on in creation. And it was all the way back in that time that there had been already distortions within the Orion Nebula. And they were really trying to figure out what were the disruptions that happened in the Orion Nebula which it turns out, long story short, it's that even from further back than that, it's still the same family line messed with the Orion Nebula. We're experimenting with it. Ended up blowing up parts of it. Ended up creating tears and distortions in its fabric field, and which created a ripple effect, which I feel really allowed entities or things from outside this universe into it right got a little too excited experimenting with creation and now all of a sudden this ripple effect but massive amounts of time went by and so suhiel was in this place of wanting to explore the universe and so she parthenogenically reproduced herself with a whole race line of beings that would take her place while she was away and she disappeared long after that she birthed in again why does she keep disappearing? Where is she going? Why would she? Because she's Sophia. As Sophia, she is already the dreamer of the dream. So she has the ability to move in and out of many dreams. So on a level that I don't think we can even understand, she's moving through all of these dream realms. And from the best of my understanding as I've gone through this, <laughs> if I was to give even a feeble attempt at describing it is that she's been learning how to move into all of these dreams in order to learn how to manage and wake up in all of the dreams think about how we're trying to learn how to be masters of our own dream and become lucid dreamers wake up in our own dream become masterful that at will we can wake up in our dream and start directing our dream well she's doing that like with all of them that's the master level and the idea of it is that if she can wake up in all the dreams, that when she then moves through that void again, so say going through a black hole again, that she could actually hold her consciousness through that transition and bring forward all of her consciousness in the waking dream. So could she come in and correct the dream? There is an idea of coming into the dream and on every level we're trying to correct the chaos, the whole, every mythology you look at, what is it a battle between chaos and order? 
<laughs> there's always the dark and the light, the good and the bad, the chaos and the order. What is it? So what is this whole dance going within the entire dream of Sophia? It is going in and figuring out where these polarizations have pulled them so far apart that they're not even dancing in a trinity wave anymore in order to bring and weave the dream be the dream weaver and weave the dream back together so now as we look at all come back and down and as Sophia what she does is she will dream herself into physical reality in different times and one of the aspects of herself that she dreamed herself into the dream was as Barbello. Now, Barbello is now referred to as the mother of origins. She's considered the mother of the Gina Abul race line. So she would be the mother of many of the Syrian star races, um, many of the um, uh, different different um, Kadistu or angelic race lines, right? Some of them reptiloid, some of them amphibioid, all of these different species and race lines. So she's called the mother of origins. And as a mother of origins, it is from this race line of the Gina Abul where the Anunnaki eventually kind of stem from. It's a hybridization that stems from them. So this is why there's now such a tie-in to the earth realm of who are these beings? Well, they're connected too. Now, within the earth plane, as we get to look at this, this is where we're going to see the cosmic egg inside of the cosmic egg inside of the cosmic egg inside of the cosmic egg. <laughs> and again, this is sometimes beyond me to even understand it, but even within the higher dimensional planes of where Barbello was and... Um, uh, within Ursa Major, as she was working, when they talk about the Orion Nebula and the destruction and the chaos within the Orion Nebula, if you look at it from that dimension and drop it down into this solar system in this dimension, it actually connects to the solar storms in Jupiter. So, very fascinating. But it's also considered that through dimensions and times, there's something about con these kind of loops in time that are happening, these distortions in times and these repetition cycles and these loops in time that happen. And within that, that in truth, the origin place and where she actually gave birth to the original race of the Gina Abul was here on Earth. <laughs> And so this is where we kind of come into the storyline where we hear through a lot of the, the star seed history and the remembrances of like, oh, well, the reptilians say they were here long before everyone else. Well, they are part of a, 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 a larger or a more ancient race line that isn't quite as hybridized as it is now, but that yes, there is a true origin right within the solar system of how some of these race lines were birthed millions and millions and millions of years ago into creation. So now as we look at Barbello, this is before she became the mother of origin. She was an astrophysicist in the as an archivist. Now, she made, and I want to read this, she made the real universe fall into a world of appearances. This is signifying her correction. When she was the mother of origin, she gave birth to different created race lines or beings. But one of them is said to be about Yaldabud. Yaldabud, which is the name that should not be spoken. <laughs> um, she was always animate about, don't say his name, because then he'll find us. Um, but... When you look at mythology, the Gnostic teachings, and you kind of look at this, that this would be even the beginning of the Luciferian lines and this kind of energy within there. And what was he is what he was a hybridization from these Kingu Babar or these um, white reptiloid beings. And within this, that he came through so powerful, but also there was a sense of, <gasps> oops, when he was born to the point where he went away. He became a master of space and time instantaneously, pretty much right after he came out of out of the egg of creation. 
And within that, in order for her to begin to correct this, she started to create dreams in order to keep him separate and in order to begin to rehabilitate and fix. Now, her idea of fix, I don't know. This is why we get to surrender to the dream of Sophia, right? And to create the harmony because in truth, his genetics is still family line from far back. It's just altered through some of its um, distortions through the radiation, through the Orion Nebula. So she was the mother of origin and she made the real universe fall into the world of appearances. She has a thought that can act on portions of the universe. Hear that. She has a thought and it can act on portions of the universe. She can actually intend dream spheres. This is like the Hyades. For those of you who have star connections to the Hyades, and we talk about these, these divine Armage or these divine priestesses that have the ability to move space and time and utilize sound technologies. These are the Hawthors, right? Utilize sound technologies to move through space and time without the need of stargates or portals or even wormholes. They don't need anything. They can dream themselves right into where they need to be. These are her. These are of her family line. These are the shadow argon. They can think a thought that can act on the universe. She is the creator of a simulation that determines the laws of our nearby universe okay so just kind of take that in now here's another term for her the name given to barbello after her disappearance she disappeared in order to begin to go deal with what had happened right there there's a whole lot to it after her disappearance the name given to her was the primordial matrix a pact was made between Barbello, who is the mother of origins, and Namu. So we're coming again to the to the mother or the guardian of Aset Isis. The mother of Isis, Aset, Baset, Hathor, is this Namu, is this Mamitu. And Barbello made an agreement with her. And this was an agreement to thwart or to overthrow the, the plans that the negative Usumgal or the negative draconian races were putting into place through these Anunnaki race lines, through these different overthrows and overtakes and the wars that were happening. So now just think of it as she created a pact with Barbello to to deal with these wars that were happening in Lyra, within the Pleiades, within the electric war, so on and so forth. So all these wars that we talk about, think about now, okay, we got these divine goddesses that have come, the creatrix beings that have come to a pact on how are we going to deal with this? And they're dealing with this through the dream realm. They're dealing with this through interdimensional realms and liminal spaces. What are all of these goddesses connected to? They're the keepers of the threshold. They're the, the, the ones that take you through the liminal spaces. They're the ones that are, they exist within the void and the light. They are the destroyer and the creator. They, they hold all within them because they are literally the ones holding the dream. So within this, Namu um, made an agreement and birthed through and created through her through one of her amasudam so one of her it came through and this being became her priestess or her right hand person and barbello in a future timeline incarnated in through the protection of namu mamitu so that is why these beings see her as the mother because it was an agreement. Okay, I'm going to come through you <laughs> and this is who I am. And, and the agreement was for Namu to protect her, to protect Barbello, to protect Barbello as she entered into the dream because it's actually dangerous to enter into the dream. And so within this, she mingled with the world. Within that, as she came through again, she mingled with the world of um, and and was birthed in as an amasudam, 
as Se'et, which is later then known as Isis. Hidden under the protective wing of Namu, it then only remained for her to abandon herself daily to the temporal drift in order to create a parallel world in which we are all confined. So what are these gates that we're getting through? Why do we have to go through stargates? Why do we have to go through doorways? Why do we have to go through these things? What is so important that there's gates? That it's making sure that you have gone through the eight different pathways of cleaning out all of the lower desires of the body so that you are in the highest alignment with, with the virtues before you enter through. This is our ability that we have the keys to make it through the dream, through the gates. And what is it that's required? Our highest virtues. Why? Because this dream is being held in containment, not to encase us or entrap us, but to protect a lot of the dream of creation from Ialdabud. From these negative Usumgal, from these negative Kingu, and these different race lines. And how is it protecting us? Because we know that, yes, in the physical reality, our physical body might have things happen to us. But what is always able to be free is our consciousness. What are we really going through initiations for? To break free our consciousness. To get to the level where we could be with the skull crusher <laughs> and not be afraid to know that it is actually the awakening through the stargate as we re-emerge back with Ra, back with the solar, back with the sun. So I'm just going to take the last couple minutes. I apologize. I went a little over today. I'm just going to invite you as you see these images. that you have the opportunity to work with different representations of Sophia, different representations of the Divine Mother, Barbello, the dream. Really, all of these are the eyes of the dreamer, the eyes of the cosmic mother, the eyes of the primordial matrix, the eyes of the infinite wisdom of how to dream your dream. And that within a dream, within anything, you can command new dream now. You can command be gone now. You can rewrite your dream. You can be the destroyer. You can be the creator. You are the dreamer. You are the dream. And you are the one being dreamed. That your greatest gift as the eye of Ra, as this, this stepping in is even just tapping into what would it be to be the eye of Ra. The eye of Ra is the transmitter of wisdom, of the light. And within the light, that we be the destroyers of any that would disrespect the sacred trinity flame. That we are here to hold virtues. That we are here to hold compassion and above all love. But that as we hold this, that we are <laughs> the womb, we are the darkness, and we are the light. We are all of it, but we be it with love. So with so much love, I am ever so grateful to have gotten to share a little bit with you this evening. I invite you to play, 
to reach out, to call, to utilize this vibration within the Trinity wave within you. And as you hold it, just see who comes to you, who comes to you in your dream, who calls to you. And when they call to you, this is a level of literally being consumed in a lot of levels. When you meet with her, she will eat you. And then you awaken inside of her. And then let her show you her wisdom. 